This section of the book is, is a kind of a fun geometric section. We're going to look at level sets of functions um, that will include level curves and level surfaces. Level sets are just uh, places where a function equals a constant. That's called a level set of a function. Um, most of the graphs that you've looked at have been level sets. They might have been graphs of functions, but you can write those as level sets. And so really we're going to look at some graphs and what does this have to do with gradient vectors since the title of the section is level sets and gradient vectors. Kind of amazingly, or maybe not so amazingly, the gradient vectors tell you a great deal about the, the geometry of, of, of a level set. It, um, it uh, tells you where it looks, the gradient vector can tell you where it looks smooth and quickly tells you what the tangent line, tangent plane, tangent set is to the surface. So it's, um, it's really very nice, it's very cool. And so let's look at some examples. Um, so as I said, typical curves that you've looked at are typical in high school or in calculus. You, know, you might have, look where y equals x squared, or you might look where x squared plus y squared equals one y equals x squared defines a parabola. It's the graph of a function. Um, this, the graph of this is not the graph of a function. It's not y equals something. Um, both of these can be written as where a function equals a constant, though. So here, if I define f of xy to be y minus x squared, then then this, the set of points where y equals x squared, is the same as the set of points where f equals 0, because y minus x squared equals 0 is the same as saying y equals x squared. Um, and this, we can think of this as we could subtract the 1 and, and look at x squared plus y squared minus 1, but we could just look at x squared plus y squared. And then this set of points, this circle, the circle that this describes, is just exactly where g equals 1. So this is the kind of thing we want to look at. You have a function of more than one variable, like um, you have y minus x squared, and you look at where it's 0, or you have x squared plus y squared, and you look at where it equals 1. Or those all give us curves, but we could also look at surfaces in space, like x squared plus y squared plus z squared, and look at where this takes on different values. Well, for instance, where s equals 4. Hopefully you realize that describes x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4. This describes a sphere of radius 2, centered at the origin. So all of these are examples of level sets, so we'll just have a definition. Definition You have some function f. It's a function of however many variables you want. So f of x. So given this. Um, a level set of f is, well, let me say the level set. The level set of f where f equals c um, for some constant c. Um, is the set of points. Set of points. X. Such that f of x 
equals the constant c. So this c is a constant. So all of the examples I was, that I gave a minute ago were examples of level sets. Naturally, if it's, uh, you get something one-dimensional, if you get a curve, you call it a level curve. If you get a surface, you call it a level surface. Beyond that, it's just level set. Um, the level set of F um, containing the point P in its domain. is a set of points. So you want it to be a level set that contains P. Well, then that tells you what the constant has to be. It has to be the value of F at P. So the level set of F containing a point P, which needs to be in the domain of F, is the set of those X's. such that f of x equals f of p. So that's a level set, what a level set is. Um, let me go back to well, look at some examples, maybe go back to some of the ones that I wrote a minute ago, but more carefully, look at them more carefully. Um, so let's look at So, as an example, let's take f of xy equals x squared minus y squared. Then consider the level set where f equals 1. So, i.e., the, the set of points where x squared minus y squared equals 1. You should remember that this describes a hyperbola in the xy plane. It uh, hits the x-axis at plus or minus 1. and has asymptotes given by y equals plus or minus x. So those are the asymptotes they're supposed to be. And you get the hyperbola, which uh, looks vaguely like this. OK. Great, so that's the level set where f equals 1. It's a hyperbola. OK, um, before we look at gradient vectors, I just want to look at level sets for a while. Um, what else might you do? You might look at other level sets for the same function. So the level set and sketch it on the same, in the same xy plane, the level, level set where f equals 2. Well, you might, I mean, okay, let's see, let's use a different color. The level set where f is 2, so this is x squared minus y squared equals 2. Well, this hits the x-axis where x is plus or minus the square root of 2, which I won't try to draw in exactly the right spot. It'll have the same asymptotes, so roughly does that. It can't hit this other curve, uh, the, the yellow curves, so f equals 2. Um, actually, we tend to draw this 
I'll put in f equals 2 here, and f equals 2 here, and then f equals 1 here, and then f equals 1 here. Your pictures get a little crowded if you do this too many times. But um, these curves can't hit each other. They can't intersect because at these points, the value of the function is 2. At these points, the value of the function is 1. If, if those curves intersected, that would have to intersect at a point where f is both 1 and 2. That can't happen. Um, you could also draw where the level set where f is minus 1. So that would be where x squared minus y squared equals minus 1. Negating everything, that would be y squared minus x squared equals 1. And so that's a hyperbola that hits the y-axis and not the x-axis. But it has the same asymptotes. So, you know, roughly... And you can draw all the level curves you want. Um, if you had a weird enough function, you'd have a computer or a calculator help you with it. I want one more before I stop drawing level curves. This, so that was, this was supposed to be f equals minus 1, and f equals minus 1. One more set of level or, one more level curve. Um, look where f equals 0. That is x squared minus y squared equals 0. That's x is plus or minus, so x squared equals y squared, so x is plus or minus y, y is plus or minus x. Those are the asymptotes. So the asymptotes, the common asymptotes of all of these hyperbolas are in fact a level curve of this function and they're here where f is 0. Um, notice one feature, this is going to be important to us later, notice that these curves, these other level curves, are all smooth. Where smooth, I'm appealing to your intuitive notion of smooth. I, there's a rigorous definition, a rigorous mathematical definition of what smooth means, but I don't want to give it. But Notice that these curves are all smooth, but the level curve where f equals 0 has a kind of a bad point at the origin. It's not smooth. In fact, the curve crosses itself. Um, that will be very relevant to us later, but for right now, I'm going to give that a cool-sounding name. Make you think of black holes or something. This is a singular point, some place where the graph is not smooth. This is a singular point. All right. Um, before I look at another example of level um, surfaces, or I want to look at level surfaces next, but before I do that, I want to say something else about this example. Um, So my comment about that example is you could look at the graph of the function that we just had. So we had f of x, y equals x squared minus y squared. And when I say the graph of it, I don't mean the, what I was calling the graph of a level surface. I mean take that function, take its graph, so that means you assign a variable name to it, and then you draw the graph of this function in three dimensions. And this is not one of the level sets we were talking about. We were looking at where this equaled various constants. You graph this um, in three dimensions. And so it gives you, you should know what this is. This is a hyperbolic paraboloid. Um, and it looks vaguely like all hyperbolic paraboloids, just turn the right way and you want to put some perspective in there. I'll try to do that. Well, 
Um, it's a hyperbolic paraboloid. And what I want to say is that should you think of this surface sitting in three dimensions and think of the level sets, so the level sets of F are the Z cross sections. which we also call contours. Um, should you be picturing this surface and thinking of the level curves of F as Z cross sections? Well, it depends. Frequently, we are interested in level sets in and of themselves. It's just a nice way of producing a curve or a surface. So. It, uh, typically, we would care about the level set in and of itself, not as a cross-section of something bigger. However, if you're trying to understand this surface, one way to do it is to look at the family of Z cross-sections. So take a whole bunch of Z cross-sections and draw them all in the same XY plane. Now, when you take cross-sections, you're at different Z coordinates, so you might picture the cross-sections in, sitting in different planes. But when you're thinking of level sets, you want to picture them all in the same xy plane. And if you're trying to use kind of z cross sections to understand the surface, you probably want to draw all of those z cross sections. Well, I shouldn't say probably. You want to look at those z cross sections in the xy plane um, and maybe take them and put them back together and form this um, surface in, that sits inside three dimensions. Um, so maybe keep track of the fact that, that they occur at different z values. But um, still, you want to draw them in the xy plane since the point of looking at the family of cross sections is to reduce this two-dimensional thing that sits inside three dimensions to looking at a collection of one-dimensional things sitting inside two dimensions. What is my point? My point is that it's really kind of psychological whether you picture this whether you picture this three-dimensional or this thing in three dimensions and take z cross sections, or just look at, um, just think of this as a collection of level curves, but frequently we only want one level curve or one level set for a very specific value of the function. Then you definitely don't want to picture the entire you know, two-dimensional surface. All right, I think I've beaten that into the ground enough. Let's look at an example of some level surfaces. So I want to look at So let's look at a new function. I guess I had it on the board earlier, x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So there's our function. I want to look at level surfaces of this function. So I want to look at where this function equals constants. Um, but it naturally breaks up into three cases. There's, so we look at case one, where s equals some constant c, and c is less than zero. So that means x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals a constant that's less than zero. Well, we're talking about points in R3, three real numbers. Three real numbers squared, well, this would have to be greater than or equal to zero. It can't add up to something less than zero. So this is empty. So even though I said level surface, in fact, you don't get anything here, so I don't know if you want to think of it as the empty level surface, but um, it's not really a surface. There's s equals c where the constant is 0, so that's x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 0. That level set um, has only one point in it, because the only thing for these three things to add up to zero, three non-negative things. They all have to be zero. So this is one point.
So again, it's not a surface. It's not a two-dimensional thing sitting inside three dimensions. But finally, if you take s equals a constant, but the constant's greater than zero, so that you're looking at x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals something greater than zero, then this is a sphere. This describes a sphere of radius the square root of c. centered at the origin. So, right, there are three kinds, three different kinds of level sets that you get for this function. If you set this equal to a constant that's less than zero, you get nothing, the empty set. If you set it equal, the level set when the function, when s equals zero is just one point. But after that, you really do get a level surface. Um, when c, if you take s equals a constant that's greater than zero, you get spheres of various radii. Um, okay, let's look at something slightly, uh, maybe before I leave this, I should point out that <laughs> there, there is no point, in this case, where you get the empty set, there's no point in the set where things look bad, because there's no point in the set. On the other hand, in this level set, where s is zero, there is a point in the set, the origin. And when you're at the origin, the level set doesn't look right. Because we would hope when you take a level set of a function of three variables, you do get a surface. You do get something kind of two-dimensional. Um, but we don't. We get something zero-dimensional. It's a point. So something is going wrong here. I won't call it a singular point like I did for, the, um, for when the two lines crossed each other. But something, the dimension that we expect isn't occurring here. Here it is. At every point in these level sets, spheres look two-dimensional. Right, they look like surfaces. So, okay, let's look at one more set of examples of level surfaces before I tell you what this has to do with gradients, gradient vectors. I want... Let's look at let's look at G equals Z minus one squared minus X squared minus Y squared minus one. Okay, and for this, for this function, I just want to look at two level sets, although it kind of just breaks up into two cases, but let's look at g equals zero, the level set where g is zero. Well, this is, then we're looking at points where z minus one squared equals, oh, let me write it in the most basic way and then change it. So we're looking at the set of points where this is true, which is z minus 1 squared equals x squared plus y squared plus 1, or maybe I should just put the 1, let me just put the 1 on the other side, equals this. Um, this, you hopefully remember, this is a, a quadric surface. You're used to maybe just a z here, z squared minus x squared minus y squared equals 1. Uh, hopefully you remember it. This is a hyperboloid of two sheets. Um, the usual one is kind of centered at the origin, and this one is shifted up one. So um, this one looks like uh, when, when x and y are both 0, you'd get z minus 1 squared equals 1. So that's z minus 1 equals plus or minus 1 z equals 0, z equals 2. It's a hyperboloid of two sheets. And up here at one of its vertices is here at z equals 2. And x and y are 0. And the other one is down here at the origin. All right. 
So the graph of this is a hyperboloid of two sheets. Um, the level, so this is the level, the level surface. It's a hyperboloid of two sheets. Um, so it's smooth everywhere. There's no point on here where, where things, where we have a sharp point or something crossing itself, or even the, the dimension is wrong. It's smooth and it's two-dimensional everywhere where I'm appealing to your intuitive notion of smooth. But what about the level surface where g is minus 1? Well, if g is minus 1, that's z minus 1 squared minus x squared minus y squared minus 1 equals minus 1. This is z minus 1 squared equals x squared plus y squared. And again, you should remember from the section on quadric surfaces, this describes a cone, that kind of double cone, but shifted up one to where the cone point is occurring, at the, where z coordinates 1 and x and y are 0. So it's It's a cone, and kind of analogous to what happened in one dimension when um, the two lines crossed themselves. Well, kind of analogous. We're getting a sharp point here. There's a sharp point where the graph gets pinched together. It doesn't look smooth. The cone point, um, sharp point at 0, 0, 1. So another singular point. All right. So anyway, taking level sets of functions is a way of producing geometric objects and you know, the level sets. Very nice. Um, but what we'd like to see is some way of analyzing in terms of things we can calculate, not just pictures, but is there some way we can know where these things look smooth? Is there, and if they are smooth, can we in some easy way find, uh, figure out what a tangent set to the, actually that's a terrible picture. Let's draw one down here. Can we figure out what a tangent set to a level surface should look like. We, we talked about tangent planes to graphs of functions, but suppose all we know is we have a level set, so maybe a level surface. Can we figure out an equation for a tangent plane without having to somehow solve for z in terms of x and y? Can we do it just from the given function that you've got a level surface of? And the answer is yes, and it all has to do with the gradient. Um, but before I can do that, I need to define tangent vectors to sets and look at tangent vectors to level surfaces and see what that has to do with gradients. So suppose you have Suppose E is a subset of some Euclidean space. Uh, a vector V, and now I'm really thinking of it as a vector, not a point, so that's why I'm putting a little vector arrow over it. A vector in Rn is a tangent vector to E at a point P in E. Maybe before I go on, I should 
tell you what I'm doing. Suppose oh, what we're after is suppose we've got some level set or something. So this is where some function equals a constant. We are trying to define, I'm at some, so this would be our set E, this level set. We're at some point P, and we want to say what a tangent vector should mean. A tangent vector to the set E at the point P. So we want, basically what we want is, when you have an intuitive notion of tangent plane, we want all the vectors in that plane. Um, so how do you get them? So suppose E is any subset of Rn. You take a point in E. What does a tangent vector to E at the point P mean? Um, you turn the, uh, a vector here. If provided, so this is the definition. There exists. differentiable function from the real numbers just from one variable differentiable function but it doesn't have to be the whole set of real numbers so a differentiable function I'll say x um, that takes you from an open interval, I guess I, so this needs to take you from an open interval in the real numbers. So A is less than B. So this is an open interval in the real numbers into E. But E sits inside of Rn, so it's a, a function from AB into Rn, but it happens, but you want this to stay inside of E. Again, maybe I should tell you what we're about to do. We're going to say a tangent vector is any vector that you get by taking a path, a, smooth, a differentiable path in here. So that's what x is going to be. So think of it as like the position of a particle or something. And this is a time interval. And we're going to say that a tangent vector is something you get by taking any one of these paths and having a time at which it passes through the point P, and then you take a velocity vector of that particle, the velocity vector of that path when you're at the point P, and any velocity vector that you can get is called a tangent vector to E. So there exists a differentiable function x like this. Think of it as specifying a point, a particle that's moving in E. It's always in E. That's important. Um, there exists a differentiable function such that at some time, at some c in the open interval, um, x at c is your point p, so that think there is a time at which you're at the point, and at that same time, um, at such that at some c and e, x at c equals p, and x prime at c is the velocity vector v. All right, so all this says, when you write it out, it looks kind of bad. It just says what we mean by a tangent vector at a point is anything you can get from, from parameterizing a differentiable curve inside of e. It has to be inside of e. Otherwise, you could take like curves that curves that go like this, and then their tangent vectors would, I mean, their velocity vectors would go clearly not be something we want to call tangent to e. Take any smooth curve that stays a differentiable curve that stays inside e, and you look at its velocity vector as it passes through the point p, and that's a tangent vector to e at p. Um, all right, we want to do this for level sets, so. My claim my claim if F now I'm back to thinking of level sets 
things that is differentiable at p. Then every tangent vector to the level set, the level set of f that contains p, so to the level set f equals f of p, and every tangent vector to the level at p. is perpendicular to the gradient vector of f at p. So this is pretty cool. It tells you that regardless of what the velocity vector is, that it has to be perpendicular to the gradient vector of the function that's defining the level set. So why is this true? If, if the proof were difficult, I wouldn't, or too technical, I wouldn't bother, I wouldn't do it for you, but it's, this is just the chain rule, right? Um, why is this just the chain rule? Suppose you've got, you're looking at the level set where the function equals a constant, and you've got a velocity vector at a point, a uh, tangent vector at a point, well, that means you've got a, a smooth curve, uh, a differentiable curve, x equals s of t, that's always on this level surface, which means that at all times t, f of x of t is this constant. But then you differentiate both sides with respect to t and use the chain rule over here. This says uh, when you differentiate this side and use the chain rule, you get the gradient of f evaluated at x of t dotted with x prime at t equals the derivative of this side, which is 0. But if we had a time at which we're at the point p, so, so this has to be true at all times, and if there was a time at which we're at the point p, so that we called c a minute ago, that would mean that the gradient vector of f at p is dotted with this velocity vector. So this is our, what we call the tangent vector. All tangent vectors are of this form, the derivative of a function as it passes through the point. We gain that this dot product is zero. But that dot product being zero is exactly what it means for the tangent vector to be perpendicular to the gradient vector. So, great, what does this have to do with tangent planes and tangent lines? Well, the, the, um, the, the tangent vectors, you look at all the tangent vectors that give you the tangent plane to a level surface, provided the gradient vector is not zero. If you look at tangent lines to curves, um, the gradient vector will be perpendicular to them. So let's, what am I talking about? Suppose we have a level curve. We have a level curve and assume we're at some point where the gradient vector is not zero. then, then the, the set of vectors that are perpendicular to this will lie in a line. Why? Well, not being zero means the gradient vector of f at p is something like a, b, where a and b are not both zero. And so the set of vectors perpendicular to it, if v is v1, v2, the set of vectors perpendicular to it would just be the ones that when you dot this with this, you get 0. So we're looking at 
those vectors such that AB1 plus BV2 equals zero. This describes a line. It describes a line through the origin, but remember these are vectors. And so really you should think of these based at P. But the real point is there's a line. If A and B were both zero, if the gradient vector were both zero, this would describe all of V1 and V2. You could have anything for V1 and V2. That would be bad. But if they're not both zero, then this, this describes a line, but that describes a line through the origin. But if you're trying to picture the tangent line, you want to draw it up here. So you want these vectors based at P. Um, and so what you're getting is that the gradient vector is perpendicular to this. So you should picture the gradient vector of f at p is either going that way or that way. We don't, unless we have f, we don't know which way. Um, and yeah, how do we know we get every vector on that line as a tangent vector? Or for a surface, let me do a level surface, it's the same kind of thing, what we're getting is if the gradient vector is not zero, then all the tangent vectors are perpendicular to the gradient vector of f at p. So another way of saying that, the gradient vector is perpendicular to all the tangent vectors, so that you should picture the gradient vector of f at p as being perpendicular to the surface because it's perpendicular to all of these tangent vectors. How do you know you get all of the tangent vectors, though? Like, yes, for any tangent vector, well, let me say that again. For any tangent vector, the gradient of f at p is perpendicular to it. But how do you know you get every vector that's perpendicular to the gradient of f at p? We know if you've got a vector that's a tangent vector, it's perpendicular to the gradient vector of f at p. But how do you know that you get every vector that's perpendicular to this as a tangent vector. That requires a theorem, um, and that is a geometric consequence of, and we will come back to this theorem later, geometric consequence of the implicit function theorem. It says a whole bunch of things, but the ones that are most relevant to us right now are that uh, geometric consequences of the implicit function theorem. It is one of them. I should have left myself more space. One is that the level set f equals f of p. is smooth, and again, I don't want to give a technical definition of smooth, um, is smooth at P if the gradient vector of F at P is not the zero vector. Um, it's smooth and of one dimension less than the space you're sitting in. Is smooth Level set. Has dimension one less than the space it's sitting in. Um, so I'll call that the ambient space, the surrounding space. And two, two, every vector perpendicular to the 
gradient vector of f of p, again, assuming the gradient vector of f of p is unequal to 0. occurs as a velocity vector, at, uh, as a tangent vector. And I, I just want to uh, say a third point without, without writing it. It actually says more than this. We, um, we already had a notion of tangent space for the graph of a function. So if you let z equal the value of the function um, and you graph it, we had back in the, when we looked at differential approximation, um, we had what a tangent set was. In what way does the collection of tangent vectors give you the same thing as the tangent set? It is part of the implicit function theorem that, in fact, if the gradient vector is not zero, and you look at, let's say that the first partial derivative is not zero, so the partial derivative with respect to x1 is not zero, then you can write x1, if you look at the level set, it is the graph of x1 equals a function of the other x's, so of x2 through xn, that the implicit function theorem tells you at a point where the gradient vector is not zero, if you take a partial derivative that's not zero, the, that variable that you took the partial derivative with respect to can be written as a function of the other variables um, when you're looking at that level set. So what it's telling you is, in theory, you can solve for x1 if you have like a level set, like x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4. If you have a place where the partial with respect to z is not 0, then it's telling you that on this level, part of what the implicit function theorem says, is for this level set, you could solve for z in terms of x and y at least near the point where the gradient vector is not 0. right? Because here you get z equals plus or minus, so you can't solve for z as a function, but at least near the point where where the gradient vector is not zero, where the partial derivative with respect to z is not zero, you can solve for z uniquely in terms of the other variables. The point is, if we did that, if we solve for z in terms of the other variables, you would have z written as the graph of this function of the other variables, so we already have a notion of the tangent set for that. And that notion of the tangent set and the ones we get from this by taking tangent vectors are the same. And that is a consequence of the implicit function theorem, too. The implicit function theorem is very deep, very important. It says lots of things. And one of those things is that our two notions of tangent spaces are the same. Um, the tangents, what we're going to have for the tangent set, the graph of a function, and the, the set that we're about to describe are the same. All right. <clears throat> so um, what does this mean? It means that, so let me draw a generic level surface again. It means that if we are trying to describe the tangent set to a level surface, here's the gradient vector at P. It's perpendicular to the tangent set, the set of all the tangent vectors. Um, or if you appeal to the implicit function theorem, the, the tangent tangent set of the graph of that function. Um, we know a point that's on our tangent set, the point P, it's on there. We know a perpendicular vector. How do you describe all the other points in the tangent set? Right. Well, you draw the vector. It starts at P and goes to X, and that's supposed to be perpendicular to the gradient vector. So at a point, the result of all this is um, at a point, where the gradient vector f of t is not 0. At a point where that's not 0, the level set is smooth. 
It has dimension one less than the ambient set, um, than the ambient space, and we know how to find um, points on its tangent space very quickly at a point where the, um, the tangent set to the level curve through P to F equals F of P is the set of X's such that the gradient vector of f at p dotted with x minus p equals zero. Right? Because um, um, this is how you get a vector based at p. You know, if you want, if you've got the tangent set, it points in it, if and only if the vector from p out to x is perpendicular to the gradient. Of f at p. So this is what we're after, or this is what we were after. So now I want to go back and look at some of our examples, but now with gradient vectors. So let's look at Let's go back to f of x, y equals x squared minus y squared. Where f, the level set where f is 1, we, we looked at this. It's a hyperbola. We've known that for a long time. It's a hyperbola. Um, Suppose we wanted to find an equation, so it's the hyperbola, where x squared minus y squared equals 1. Suppose you wanted to find an equation for the tangent line somewhere, right? Um, somewhere on this curve. Well, you could solve for y in terms of x and try to do that, and you'd have plus or minus sign, and it would just depend. But this is a level set of this function of two variables, and we now know the gradient. It all has to do with the gradient vector. So let's calculate the gradient vector. It, this curve looks smooth everywhere. Um, let's look at the gradient vector of f. It's the partial derivative with respect to x, comma, the partial derivative with respect to y. This is what we get. Notice that this gradient vector is 0. The gradient vector of f equals the zero vector if and only if x is zero and y is zero. So the only place where the graph, a level set of this function, could fail to be smooth is at the origin, when x and y are zero. Of course, when x and y are 0, the value of f is 0. So that's on the level set where f is 0. The level set where f is 1, you don't have any places where the gradient vector is 0. So that means the implicit function theorem tells us, oh, the set is smooth everywhere. It's smooth at every point, and it has dimension 1 less than the ambient space. So the ambient space is two-dimensional, so it has dimension 1. And if you want an equation for the tangent line somewhere, then you can just say it's, you can just use that it, it's the, you look at where the gradient of f dotted with x minus p is zero. So let's do that. Uh, normally, when we just have x and y, that's x vector. It's just x, y. Let's say we're at some point a, b. Well, this, this just means the partial derivative of f with respect to x at a, b. So that's a constant um, times x minus a plus the partial derivative of f with respect to y at a, b. 
right, um, times y minus b equals 0. So let's do this at some point. Right? Let's, let's give an equation for a tangent line here. Now, you intuitively, you may think, oh, but a tangent line there would be vertical. Its slope is infinite. So we really can't have a tangent line there. Well, there is a tangent line. It's just x equals some fixed number. It should be x equals 1. The good news is that this presentation of the tangent line still works. So let's, let's do this. So we're calculating things at, this is the point, 1, 0. The, um, the, grade, the partial derivative of f with respect to x at 1, 0, you get 2x. But when you're evaluating 1, 0, you get 2. So this will be 2. Um, a is 1, and I'm now putting in AB is 1, 0. A is 1. Partial derivative of f with respect to y is 2y, but then you put in at 1, 0, so the y coordinate there is 0, so this is 0 times, well, y minus 0, but it doesn't matter. What we get is 2 times x minus 1 equals 0. Well, yeah, that's the same as saying x minus 1 is 0. That's x equals 1. Yes, we get this vertical line, which is the tangent line. Um, so that's good. Um, all right. What else is interesting about level sets of this? Well, let's go back to the level set at 0. So we're now looking at f, the same function f, but now let's look where f is 0. Wow. Our gradient vector hasn't changed. It's still 2x minus 2y. But remember, there's a point here where the gradient vector is 0. It's when x is 0 and y is 0. And now that is on when x is 0 and y is 0, the value of f is 0. That is on this level set. And so, yeah, we know that this level set is this. And this point that we were worried about, where the set doesn't look smooth and it doesn't look like it should have a tangent plane, well, that's precisely where the gradient vector is 0. So we can't appeal to the implicit function theorem Oh, it has to be smooth there because the gradient vector is zero. It's true the gradient vector could be zero and it's still, and the level set is still smooth. That can happen. Um, but the only places where things can be bad is where the gradient vector is zero, and they frequently are. And that's one of them. The gradient vector is zero there, so that um, we're not guaranteed that level set's smooth, and in fact, it's not. So there is no well defined tangent plane at 0, 0. Um, of course, or tangent line. Of course, there are tangent lines at other points, but not at the origin. All right, let's go back and look at the sphere example. So we had s of x, y, z is x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Let's go ahead and look at its gradient vector. The gradient vector at an arbitrary x, y, z, 2x, 2y, 2z. That means the gradient vector is 0. Well, for this to be 0, you'd need x to be 0, y to be 0, and z to be 0. This is 0 if and only if. x, y, z is 0, 0, 0. That occurs on the level set where s is 0. And if x, y, and z are 0, the value of s is 0. So the other level sets don't have any problem points. Now, <laughs> what we saw is that if s equals a constant and that constant is less than 0, there are no points on the level set. 
there are no points in the level set. The set is empty. Well, then there are no points where the set isn't smooth. Right? There are no singular points. There are any points on the level set where the where things look bad because there aren't any points on the level set. I know that sounds kind of weird, but it's it's true. It's um, we don't see any problems here because <laughs> there aren't any points here at which to see problems. But um, the level set where s is zero. We looked at this before. It's a single point. Now a point, does it look smooth? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, technically a point is a, something called a smooth submanifold, but it certainly isn't of the expected dimension. The implicit function theorem would tell us that if, if the gradient vector were non-zero, then not only is the level set smooth, but has dimension one less than the surrounding space, well, we're sitting in three dimensions. One less than that would be two-dimensional. This is just a point. And the reason it can fail to look like a smooth surface is exactly that the gradient vector there is zero. The gradient vector at the origin is zero. So, yeah, the fact that this is a point is, is uh, not that surprising. But all the other level surfaces, <clears throat> all the other level surfaces of this, so where C is greater than zero. All of those will be smooth surfaces everywhere because the only place our gradient vector is zero is at the origin and that's not on any of these level surfaces. So you definitely get a smooth surface everywhere. Well, we knew that. You get spheres everywhere, but we're just verifying it. We also know what we better get for a tangent plane to a sphere centered at the origin. Um, so let's, let's look at where s is 9, for instance. So that's x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 9. It's a sphere. Or actually, let's look at, <laughs> just to make the numbers easy for me, let's look at where this is, is um, 14, so that we're looking at this. Yes, it makes the radius, the square root of 14. But I just wanted a, a convenient point. And now the point 1, 2, 3 is in the level set. Because you get 9 plus 4, that's 13, 14. Right, great. It's a sphere of radius the square root of 14 centered at the origin. And I'm not going to try to draw 1, 2, 3 in the right place, but the point is we already know what we better get for a tangent plane. It better be all that stuff that's perpendicular to one of the radii, out to, or to the radius that goes, a radial ray that goes from the origin out to the point in question. So is that what we get from our gradient calculation. Well, suppose we, we said the tangent set, the tangent plane, is given by the gradient vector of F, uh, S now, the gradient vector of S at 1, 2, 3, dotted with, and now I'll write X, Y, Z, minus the point 1, 2, 3 equals 0. OK, we need our gradient vector calculated at 1, 2, 3. The gradient vector of our function s was easy. It's 2x, 2y, 2z. So the gradient vector of s at 1, 2, 3 is, so, well, this is just 2 times x, y, z. So it's just two times, so I should write that, this is two times x, y, z. So this is two times one, two, three. Um, so yeah, we get that two times one, two, three dotted with x, y, z minus one, two, three should be zero. Well, 
yeah, good. This, this 1, 2, 3 is this vector from the origin out to the point 1, 2, 3. Yeah, you've multiplied by 2 and it equals 0, but that's the same. that being 0 is you could wipe out the 2. And then, yeah, you want that to be perpendicular to everything of the form. Here's an x, y, z. And you subtract the 1, 2, 3, and you dot with that vector. So, yes, of course, this is, is what you get. Uh, you can write this out more neatly. This is 1 times x minus 1, or I don't know if it's more neatly, but it uh, looks more normal, plus 2 times y minus 2, plus 3 times z minus 3, equals 0. So that's an equation for a plane, and it's the tangent plane to the sphere at the point 1, 2, 3. I just want to do the one more example, and that was the, the cone that we looked at, and then we'll be finished. So let's look at, um, let's look at our cone from before. So we had g of x, y, z equals z minus 1 squared minus x squared minus y squared minus 1. We had this. And the level set where g was minus 1 had this sharp point. And this was a cone one of these double cones. And I said it had a sharp point at 0, 0, 1. Well, then the gradient vector better be 0 at 0, 0, 1. So, is it? So, the gradient vector of G is partial with respect to x minus 2x, the partial derivative with respect to y minus 2y, partial derivative with respect to z, 2 times z minus 1. So the gradient vector of g equals the zero vector if and only if x is 0, y is 0, and 2z 2 times z minus 1 is 0, but that means z is 1. So yes, the only place the gradient vector is 0 is at this point, which is on the level surface where g is minus 1. So of all the level surfaces of this, there's only one that has a singular point. That's when g is minus 1. All of the rest of them will be smooth surfaces. They're all, they're all um, hyperboloids of two sheets. Um, but yeah, we get this one problem. And that occurs on the level surface where g is minus 1, and only at this point. Every place else, even this level surface, is smooth every place else except at that one point because the gradient vector is non-zero every place else. So uh, last, last thing I want to do, what's an equation An equation for the tangent plane to the level surface where g is minus 1 at the point uh, I think there was a specific point I wanted to use from the book Ah, yes. At the point 3, 4, 6, um, I should say something about 3, 4, 6. Uh, where g is minus 1, we're looking at where z minus 1 squared equals x squared plus y squared. This, 3, 4, 6 is a messed up Pythagorean triple. X is 3, Y is 4, so you get 9. Um, 
and 16, 25, but here is 6 minus 1, so 5 squared, 25, yeah, so we, yeah, devious and used a Pythagorean triple, but what's an equation for the tangent plane to g equals minus, to the level set given by g equals minus 1 at the point 3, 4, 6? This is easy. You just, you just write this as fast as you can write, really. Yeah, this dot product, you do this dot product, but that just means the, the, co the numbers in the gradient vector end up as coefficients. So it is just, we take the gradient vector of g, which is minus 2x minus 2y, 2 times z minus 1, and another way of writing this is Pull out a 2, 2 times minus x minus y, z minus 1. At 3, 4, 6, um, so the gradient vector of g at 3, 4, 6 is 2 times, all right, x is 3, so we get minus 3, y is 4, so we get minus 4, z is 6, so we get 5. So um, we just we need the gradient vector of g, 3, 4, 6, to be perpendicular to x, y, z minus 3, 4, 6. But that just means you take x, y, and z minus the coordinates of the point where you're calculating it. So you take x minus 3, and then you throw in, the, you multiply, you, for coefficients, you use the components of the gradient vector. So we would have minus 6, and then a minus 8 times y minus 4, and then a plus 10 times z minus 6. Yeah, you can write it in terms of the dot product, but if you want to write it out, it looks more like this. Notice that we could have just left off the 2. Being perpendicular to this thing with the 2 and without the 2 is the same thing. That's like dividing this by 2 in the end when you're finished. So having a minus 3, a minus 4, and a 5. But the point is that if you're given the set as the level set of a function and you want a tangent space, a tangent set, at the point, you don't solve for one of the variables in terms of the others. You just take the gradient vector of the function, and assuming it's not zero, then um, you'll just use those, the components of the gradient vector as coefficients, and take your coordinates, your general coordinates, like x, y, and z, minus the corresponding coordinates of the specific point you're at, and set everything equal to zero. That's what's so nice about the gradient vector and level sets of functions.